All right, so let's jump into now this question of um, not what the neural circuits are of sleep and so forth, but why exactly we sleep. And this question of why we sleep actually does not have one simple answer. It's actually thought that there are multiple different reasons that, that all play a certain role in it. Um, so we're going to talk about those, about these ideas of sleep as restoration, as a restorative process, as providing certain survival advantages, um, as an opportunity to simulate future and potentially rare situations, and then um, importantly, um, sleep in the role that it plays in uh, information processing and learning and so forth. Um, so we're going to go through each one of these, but let's start with sleep as restorative. So it actually turns out that, as you can imagine, organisms can repair and recuperate from depleting their, their from depletion that is caused by their daily waking activities. Um, now, the thing that's interesting is that you'd probably predict that more sedentary animals need to sleep less than active animals under this idea, then that if you're depleting your resources from being up and at them all day long, then if you're a pretty sedentary animal, you're actually going to probably have less reason to sleep as much because you don't need quite as much restoration, right? Um, well, let's take a look at this plot here where you can see the time of sleep as animals spend per day, however many hours per day. Um, and let's just look at this a little bit. Okay, horses. Think of horse. I don't, you know, I don't really know a ton about horses. Are horses active or sedentary? I'm not really sure. So here are humans as a baseline. You definitely can think of koala bears as being particularly sedentary. They don't move a whole ton, but they sleep a lot. Um, and then conversely, bats, though, which are much more sedentary, um, also sleep a lot. Um, and so, you know, horses are far more active than koalas. I at least know much, that much is true. But even though they're so much more active than koalas, they sleep much less than koalas do. So it actually turns out that this restorative theory might not be able to tell the whole story um, because it's not as if there's a perfect correlation by any means between the amount of sleep and the amount of daily energy used uh, in a given day. Um, so another idea about why sleep though can be useful is that it provides a certain survival adaptation um, because it allows organisms to save energy um, when they can't see very well, when they won't be able to find food, when they won't be able to find water. Um, so it's the type of thing where it's like, okay, you know, let's not waste energy. If it's nighttime, if you're the type of animal that needs to forage for food and water at night, since you're not going to find it, let's go to sleep, save those resources, use them up um, tomorrow when you um, can potentially find those things. But of course, some animals are nocturnal. Um, and don't some animals have night vision? Um, don't some animals, you know, thrive at night? So how exactly does this work? So interestingly enough, in this situation, when, you, when we're talking about um, sleep as a survival adaptation, let's take a look again at um, this plot here. And what this plot is showing you all these different animals and the amount of hours that they sleep in a given day. Um, and I want you to think about what might the organizing principle be here that is leading some animals to sleep more and some animals to sleep less, okay? So it's not, I'll give you a hint about daily activity. I wonder if anyone might see what the organizing principle would be. Why are some animals up high and some down low? This might help hopefully give it away. Okay, what do those red animals have in common and those green animals have in common? In this particular situation, what I'm just trying to highlight is that the red animals are animals that are predators and the green animals are animals that are prey. So in this particular situation, you can see like, oh, maybe another force that's playing a role um, in terms of survival adaptations is that for animals that need, that are being hunted and it could potentially be eaten by other animals, they have evolved to not sleep as much. Whereas animals that do the hunting, they can sleep more because they're the ones who are, you know, in less danger um, of being eaten by a predator. So that's another example of, of, a, of a factor that can play a role with determining sleep duration. Another theory that is thought to play a role with sleep, um, this is particularly related to dreams, is this idea of it allows the brain to simulate and work through rare situations. So sleep under this view exists to simulate threatening situations and kind of prepare for how to respond to them um, while dreaming. Um, and it's a really interesting idea, one that I, I particularly am kind of fond of. I think it's kind of a cool idea to, to have evolved for this, but there's actually real, no real direct evidence that supports it. It's just sort of a theory that people have. Um, whereas the last thing that I'd like to talk about at length, because I think this plays the most direct role for most of our lives, especially in the modern world, is the role between sleep and information processing. Um, information processing, rather. Because sleep is thought to help you consolidate things that you have learned. Um, so once things have learned, it's almost like hitting a, uh, things have been, yeah, learned, it's like hitting a save button, almost to kind of, you know, commit them to memory. But in addition, sleep also prepares your brain to learn new things. So I sort of think of it as almost like it allows your brain to be like a sponge that's ready to soak up information. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the evidence 
showing that it helps you consolidate things you have learned and also helps you prepare to learn. So let's start here up at the top with consolidating things you've learned. So a really simple task, and but a, a really replicable way to show this effect is it comes from a behavioral experiment where what I want you to do is find the T amongst the L's. So in a second, I'm gonna show you a display of a bunch of uh, L's that have been rotated in a bunch of different angles and degrees, and there's one T among them, a capital T, and I want you to find it, okay? So let's see how well we can do this. So one, two, three, here we go. All right, hopefully you're able to find there is the T, okay? That was hopefully pretty easy. Let's try another one. Uh, where is it? Oh, I made it, oh yeah, there it is. There's the T right there, okay? And so what you can do is you can just basically figure out how long does it take people to find the T amongst the L's. Super simple task, okay? Um, and what you can do is you can bring people in, have them do it at 9 a.m., first thing in the morning. And then what you can also do is have them do it at 7 p.m. later that night, and then you can have them do it again at 9 p.m. the next day, okay? But the thing that's interesting is what you can do is you can see how different types of sleep during this process of doing it again and again and again affect your ability to do it well and to do it successfully. And the reason that you wanna have multiple benchmarks where you've done it multiple times is so that you can specifically see from like one day to the next how much better or worse you've gotten as a function of sleep. And in this case, actually, the sleep is not gonna be a normal healthy night's sleep, although we definitely talk about that. It's actually just gonna be in the form of a nap, okay? Specifically a, a power nap, as you might think about it. So in this um, plot here, what I'm gonna show you is milliseconds on the vertical axis. And this is just showing how much better you're getting at the find the T's amongst the L task. Because remember, with that task, what are we measuring? We're measuring how long it takes you to find the T amongst the L's. So we're gonna see basically from day one to day two, how much better you're getting at this, okay? So by how many milliseconds difference. And you're gonna be split up into, the people are gonna be split up into three groups. The group that takes no nap, the group that takes a 60 minute nap, and the group that takes a 90 minute nap, okay? And while they're gonna be doing this, they're going to be measuring these brain waves to see and make sure that people have entered either into only the lightest sleeps or have entered into um, REM sleep, for example. So in this situation, what we actually find is that for individuals that don't take a nap, what can happen is if they're exhausted and they're up long enough, they will get worse at this, okay? They'll actually be worse um, when they try to sometimes do this later in the day, say at 7 p.m. than they were at 9 a.m. because they're you know, exhausted, they're kind of worn out from the day, they didn't get a nap, so their performance drops. So they're gonna be slower to find the T amongst the L's than before, okay? And what you can do is you can compare that though for people who got slow wave sleep but did not get into REM, okay? So what we're seeing down here, this SWS means slow wave sleep, but it wasn't the REM cycle, okay? And in that case, there's no real difference. So the nap, you might have thought the slow wave sleep nap would have helped, but the lack of REM cycle seems to have kind of counterbalanced it. So there's you know, no real benefit or detriment in this case. However, if people do get enough sleep, and they get both slow wave sleep and they're able to enter into the REM cycle, now you actually get better. Now you're actually going to improve your performance. And so it actually turns out that what you can see is that from just taking a nap, okay, it doesn't even have to be a super long nap, just something like an hour, um, it will help you consolidate those skills that you have learned, okay? And so this is true not only when it, oops, sorry, not only when it comes to basic things like T's and L's, this also occurs, and you know, we could go into studies, but this is just the easiest one to kind of do quickly, learning vocabulary, learning facts, that it actually turns out that getting a good night's sleep, specifically getting good REM sleep, will actually help you consolidate the things you've learned, the skills you've learned, and so on and so forth. This is actually, for those athletes amongst you, this has actually also been shown to be true for motor coordination and learning motor skills. You can actually find that people will do better and show improvements and more steady uh, improvement in athletic performance if they get REM sleep versus if they don't. Okay, so let's now talk a little bit about this idea about sleep preparing your brain now to learn new things. So the last stuff we were talking about was kind of consolidating stuff you already have learned. Now this is bracing your brain to learn. Um, and so in this particular case, the way that these studies work, these studies are miserable if you are a, a participant or an experimenter. Because for some group, actually, it's not that bad. You come in, you go into a lab, you get a full eight hours of sleep, you know, easy peasy, not a big deal. It's kind of un uncomfortable to sleep in the lab or whatever. The other group though, uh, pulls an all-nighter. They come into the lab, they are kept awake, they have to stay awake, the experimenters have to stay awake. It's just very unpleasant. No caffeine, no sleep, nothing, okay? 
And then after this uh, eight hours of not going to sleep is done, it's the next morning you pulled an all-nighter. What they do is that you will then go into the scanner and you will be shown a bunch of uh, images and you're just going to be told to memorize them. Because what's going to happen is on like day one, you'll go into the scanner and you have to try to remember all these images that you see. And then two days later, you'll come in and you'll see a stream of images and you have to say like, oh, I've seen that one. I haven't been seen that one. That one's rep, rep, re repeated. That one's brand new. Um, and they're going to be looking at what's going on in your brain while you're doing this, either after a full night's rest or when you've been sleep deprived. Okay. So here on the vertical axis, we're just looking at the percentage of how well people are able to get these um, to do on this particular task of just recognizing old new images. And then over here, we have SC and SD. SC stands for sleep control. Those are the people who got to go to sleep at night. And SD stands for sleep deprived. Those are the people who did an all-nighter. So for the control group, they're able to remember these images decently well. They get it right like 80% of the time, um, two days later. So that's the other thing is this is two days later. They're now rested. Um, so they're trying to remember what they saw when they were either well rested for this group or sleep deprived. And when they were sleep deprived, when they initially learned it, as you can imagine, they just did way, way worse. Like they just really had a terrible job. It's kind of, you know, they kind of giggle. They're like, I'm really sorry. I can't remember. I was so tired. I couldn't get that information in there because I was so exhausted. That's the sort of intuitive idea. But since they were doing this in the scanner, they can actually also look at what's going on in the hippocampus, because as we talked about uh, last week, the hippocampus, a critical place um, for taking information and consolidating into long-term memory. And you can look at the activation of the hippocampus while people are initially trying to consolidate that information into memory. Um, and what you see is that the uh, group that was able to get to sleep, their hippocampus is far more active than the individuals who had not gone to sleep. And so literally what's going on is that you can't commit new experiences to memory without a functioning hippocampus, which sleep seems to turn off, okay? So it actually seems to be the case that if you're really sleep deprived, the chances of you getting more information in there is just very limited because your hippocampus is effectively not able to get activated in the same way. This is important for you all if you're ever studying. It hits, I always tell students, it gets to a point where you're so tired, I'm like, it's not worth it anymore. It'd be way, you would be better served going to sleep than trying to cram more information into your head because A, you're denying yourself good REM sleep to consolidate what you've learned before, and B, the stuff that you're learning now, you're not gonna even remember it anyways because you're so sleep deprived, because like I was saying, your hippocampus isn't even really that on when you're, uh, what you call it, uh, deprived of so much sleep. Um, okay, so when talking about why we sleep, and you know, we've talked about all these different ideas and there's definitely um, some evidence for all, almost all of them except for this one, Sometimes students want to say like, wait, but Professor Cohen, which one is the main thing? And the answer I just want to say is it's, it's really all of the things. It's really actually thought that we are sleeping for not just one reason, but for a wide variety of reasons. It can have certain survival adaptations. It can play, be, play a restorative role, um, cleaning your brain out, repairing your body. It can help you consolidate information and so on and so forth. Uh, and so the last thing that we'll talk about regarding sleep will be related to sleep disorders. Um, and so on and so forth. But why don't we, we'll take a break there and that's what we'll do um, in the next unit.